Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. Recyclico's patented recycling process achieves up to 100% recovery of battery metals from lithium ion batteries for electric vehicles, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, and aluminum. Recyclico Battery Materials Incorporated trades on the TSX Venture AMY, on the OTCQB AMYZF, and Frankfurt ID4. For more information, visit Recyclicode.com or phone us at 778-574-4444. Recyclico, making lithium ion last forever. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. He's speaking to us from Vancouver. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Yeah, hi, Jim. Good to be with you and good with, to be with our listeners out there. And uh, What kind of a world is it out there? Well, it's pretty wet and stormy. <laughs> yeah, it is here at Vancouver, yep. The rain's pelting on the window, sounding like uh, small rocks hitting it. Oh, Ooh. right. No, you're Ooh. getting it worse than I am. So. Yeah, well, I'm right on the waterfront and uh-huh. facing where the weather comes from. Yeah. The nasty weather. It's interesting. The nasty weather in Vancouver comes from the east. because From it's, uh, the southeast, yes, yeah. it does. Because yeah, it comes roaring out of the, the mountains. Yeah, yeah. Several questions to get into today. Our first question comes from Chris. Hi, Bob and Jim. I read today that the U.S. penny costs 2.72 cents to produce. The nickel costs 10.4 cents to produce. What does financial history tell us about these types of events, especially as they relate to the senior currency of the country at the time? Thank you very much. Yeah, Chris from Rhode Island. Yeah, that's a good question. It's uh, been in... uh I think it was Zero Hedge had an article on this the other day. Uh, it's just one of those things. Uh, but you can go back in history when the British penny, a copper penny, was made with copper. And it was almost the size of a quarter. But it was real. Like, I mean, it was a penny's worth of copper in it. Whereas I think our pennies these days, although... They don't, don't circulate around that much. I think they're kind of a fair amount of zinc in them and have been debased. So, yeah. Well, Canada yeah. doesn't make pennies anymore because exactly it costs they 2.72 cost yeah. cents to make. Yeah, and they're too small a denomination now, whereas back in England in the deflationary period, period they, they had a farthing. And then they went to a quarter farthing uh, because uh, they needed uh, a right size coin. The, the 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 real main coin was too big and it had too much purchasing power. So they get you get into some very interesting things uh, when it comes to the amount of metal in coinage. Well, uh, now uh, it says the cost of production. What I'm wondering is, if you melted it down, would it be worth 2.72 cents or not? No, because there's zinc in it. Ah. Yeah. So it's not even a pure copper yeah, coin. I, I do recall the old British penny, a bob, a quarter. It was more like the, the size of a Canadian loony or toonie. Well, it was, yeah, man, yeah, it was bigger it was than huge. a quarter. Yeah. You could almost use it for a hockey but, puck. But they had, the, then it had to have. Uh, a, 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 a penny's worth of copper in the penny. And it's the same as a silver coin would have had, had the equivalent amount of silver in it, you know. Aren't so. old dimes worth a fortune because they're real silver? Oh, prior, prior to 1968, yeah, 10 cent and 25 cent and 50 cent pieces. And, and actually there was at one time dollar pieces were, uh, Fairly good silver content. Hmm. And then, of course, then in 68, inflation kind of took off, and everybody went and got bags of uh, coinage from the banks and went through them, taking out the pre-1968 
dimes, quarters, and 50 cent pieces. Uh, yeah, it happens and it happens again, and then it'll happen yet again. Our next set of questions comes from Andrew. Hi, Jim and Bob. Uh, question one. Chairman Powell 2024 stated that they're not confident that inflation is heading in the right direction as it has declined from about 10% to under 3%. This reminds me of Chairman Powell 2021 who kept saying they believed inflationary effects were transitory and hence would come down and go away. And as it went from 1.25% to 10% from 2020 to 2022. Since yeah. Treasury's already made a move down in yields, what more could the Fed be waiting for before they lower rates? Yeah. They, uh, the story actually is about the Fed lowering rates. The street really believes that it helps. But if you take and plot the chart of the S&P against the plot of the T-bill rate, which the Fed has to follow, uh, and T-bill rates go up in the boom. So it, it's uh, rising interest rates is a reinforcing. It's a positive. And then they go down on the bust and they really go down. So yeah, you, you, I've got the chart here and the, uh, uh, the, uh, and the rates, there are times when the rates plunge severely at the same time as the S&P is going down severely. So the street now, and I've been gathering headlines, are full of the story that when the Fed cuts rates, it'll be good for the stock market, but it is 100% wrong, and anybody who follows that advice will take a, a major hit in their portfolio. It's almost criminal that that statement exists. So, anyways, I'm writing an article on it. <laughs> right, and if you tune in to This Week in Money, Wolf Richter uh, told us that one of the Fed chairmen feels that uh, core inflation in the U.S., not the 3% rate that uh, Andrew talked about, but he said core inflation in the U.S. is running at 7% still, and one of the Fed chairs is saying, what do you mean hold interest rates? We may have to hike them again this year and not lower them. Yeah. Uh, the the, the six-month T-bill rate has been coming down since August. Yeah. And that is saying that the boom may be over. And because in 1929, the T-bill rate went up into May-June and then rolled over and declined. And that event was saying, hey, people, the boom is over. And, of course, the stock market peaked in that fateful September and then crashed in the fall. So, uh, and then you went into the, uh, to that severe recession. So, anyways, the, um, no, the, uh, the market rates of interest as, represented by the six-month Treasury bill are down about 35 basis points since their high in August. And I take this as kind of a warning on the party. Our second question from Andrew, what is Bob's view on gold miners? Many of them keep making new lows despite gold eyeing new all-time highs. Yeah. They, um, as I often mention, the dollar uh, uh, down, gold up, is a very old mantra. It's been really fully employed since the 1960s. But then with all the historical work I've done, what happens to gold after a bubble is really important. And what happens to gold after a bubble is that the prices of things like mining costs and labor and equipment, and machinery, energy, all fall relative to the price of gold. Then that improves profit margins. So gold miners increase production. 
and then that gold eventually gets into the banking system, which starts to reliquify things. But at the same time, you're still in a very lengthy credit contraction from too many bonds being issued during the party. So this is where now what we use is gold divided by commodities, and it's been an uptrend for, uh, I guess, a year and a half now. Uh, not new highs now, but it, it corrected and uh, it's just acting well. And then also the other way to do it, it's more readily understood, is that energy costs are about 60% of mining. And crude oil is the proxy for energy costs. So if you take uh, gold and divide it by crude oil, you then have a chart showing uh, the... Uh, price of gold relative to the um, the crude oil cost. And it's been doing very well. So gold has been not at new highs compared to commodities or compared to crude oil, but the chart looks good. And then on the next set of major troubles, which could, could be seen kind of uh, beginning around mid-year, um, then I think the price of these items will fall even faster relative to gold, thereby improving the profit margins. Now, this has been on for quite a few months now, uh, well, maybe a year, and it should be helping gold mining gold producers right now. And where it eventually helps out with the, uh, with the junior golds is that uh, if you have... Uh, Valuations going up for gold mines and gold uh, mineral deposits, then it's worthwhile. It really incentivizes the street to start hustling and looking at gold exploration bets. So this is a, this is a long term thing. We're early stages in it, and I think what's going to happen eventually is that the the uh, the GDXJ, gold mining stocks, will outperform the S&P. And when you got that happening, you're going to have some hotshot young fund managers, equity fund managers, that are looking at a couple of quarters of the, of the gold stocks outperforming S&P. Guess what? They're going to have to buy gold stocks. So they will bring in a player who wouldn't otherwise be in. So, Jim, what I'm saying is that we're in the early stages of a, ro- a very long rise in gold's real price, and that will be associated with a rise in earnings, and it'll turn the go- gold stocks into an investment. Whereas if you're buying gold stocks on the old mojo about dollar down, gold up, you're actually speculating in foreign exchange markets. But when you buy gold shares based upon improving earnings, that's an investment. So get out there and <laughs> invest in some gold stocks. Yeah, we like the sector. We've got a, a list, I guess it's about 12 juniors. That's uh, a interesting way to get positioned. It might trade flat for a long time. But eventually when we get into the market, some of these junior prices can be uh, quite a good advance. You, you, also within the list of the junior stocks, there may be some that could turn out to be turkeys, but you never know. I remember I did this many years ago. I got a list from uh, one of the gold fund managers of five uh, exploration bets. Well, one of them turned out to be Air Quipa, and it went to $30. So all you need is one of those, and you're, you're happy for life. <laughs> Our uh, third question comes from Michael. Hi, Bob and Jim. Bitcoin to new all-time highs. Well, it's at sixty grand. Its all-time high was sixty-eight thousand seven hundred and eighty-nine. Yeah. And just recall, Bitcoin two years ago, it was only uh, sixteen and a half thousand. That started the year at forty-two thousand. So at sixty, you made some money. But uh, isn't the case with uh, something like Bitcoin 
Uh, the faster it goes up, the faster it can come down. Oh, that holds for most anything, Jim. It's a it's a spectacular market phenomenon, um, and people play it as a counter within within this great bull market. And uh, as I say, it's been going straight up lately, uh, approaching highs of a few years ago. So, uh, yeah, it's great performance lately. As I say, straight up, and sometimes straight up bothers me. But uh, my colleague Ross Clark is monitoring it for uh, for excesses. And uh, calling straight ups is very difficult, but we'll just see where it goes here. And uh, it's 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 been a great game. I was going to say, if you throw something straight up, it comes straight down and lands on top of you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say about bullets. You know, yeah. these crazy people in the Mideast, when they celebrate, they fire their Kalashnikov machine guns straight up in the air. Well, those bullets come down. Now, they tumble, but they're still coming down at a speed that you would not want to get hit uh, on the head by one of those if you didn't have a hard hat on. Out in the desert, Mythbusters fired a pistol into the air. The bullet came down and penetrated uh, maybe an inch into the soil. A rifle bullet went a foot in. Whoa. Yeah. So well, I guess yeah, it depends on the on the the weight, the caliber, and the weight of the actual round. Well, also the higher it goes, the more it's going to accelerate on the way down. Yeah, but eventually it reaches terminal velocity. Yeah, so, but uh, bullets are pointy, so they can go supersonic. Yeah, but, but they tumble on the way down. Yeah. Well, either way, it's not pleasant. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, Michael continues here. Most of the indices are to new highs. There seems to be no wall of worry, no expectation of a hard landing. Bob, assuming this is a blow off top, could this be the biggest balloon to burst of all time? Oh, you hit it. That's a great line. It has been the biggest bubble in history, but... Keep in mind, you know, the number five was 1929. And for participants then, it was the greatest bubble in history. Also, the 1873 example was also the greatest in history. So each one has been the greatest in a generation. And uh, the convictions that the straight-ups will continue get very powerful and uh, actually uh, John Kenneth Galbraith has got a very good line on that I can't even remember a single part of it but uh, I'll look it up and we can talk about it next week about the convictions of the people in the bull market as it, as the bull market becomes mature so yeah it happens it's a phenomenon Yeah, Michael goes on Bob, where is all this money coming from that's inflating these markets given central bank tightening and consumer credit getting tapped out? Well, I'm always suspect when the central bank says it's tightening because I never think they do. I think it might be fashionable to talk about it for a while. But then the market's going to tighten on its own once the contraction comes in and then the Fed is completely disarmed and margin clerks take over and the Fed is shoved to the sideline. That happens every time. So, uh, no, the, uh, you know, the, the, the Fed tightening, it has to be taken with a grain of salt. Uh, they are geared there to prevent bad things from happening. And in their minds, bad things from happening are, pre- are prevented by easing money. So they're always built in to be on the easing money side. So we'll see what happens. But as I say, when you get into a full-fledged contraction, the power shifts over the margin clerks and the and the Fed has no ability to inflate uh, credit when you're in a credit contraction. Uh Michael continues, not long ago, financial pundits would say have 2 to 4% gold 
and maybe some Bitcoin in your portfolio. Recently, they're saying have 5% Bitcoin in your portfolio and maybe a little gold. Bob, I'm confused. <laughs> I'm confused, Bob. Has Bitcoin replaced gold? Also, uh, In some minds, yes. Hmm. They're putting it in as a foundation holding. Hmm. And uh, when it's going straight up, you really can't do that. And as it goes straight up, one would be wise at some point to take some money off the table in it. And then the old saying about you want to have some gold in your portfolio as sort of a foundation item. Yeah, that is long standing. but I just much prefer to trade the gold stocks uh, at a time. Uh, well, I uh, guess it was October when we advised accumulation and uh, of the gold stocks, and uh, the sector's been acting okay, but it's early stages in a multi-year bull market for the gold sector that at times can be absolutely spectacular. Michael continues, I think you would need more than 2 to 4% in gold to protect one's portfolio. Portfolio, How much gold should you have? Oh, pick a number, 5%. Yeah. You know, that's a personal call. Yeah. Also, I mean, we've had the horror stories already. Uh, gosh, uh, it would have been seven years ago where uh, at a party, everybody was going, do you have your Bitcoin? It's up to 13 grand. You better get your Bitcoin. <laughs> the very next day, it lost $5,000. Yeah. And, and you always know, Bob, is it really true? Once people start talking about a certain investment at a party, that's the very time not to get into it? It's, 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 yeah, it's usually associated with the top when everybody is talking about the hot item. Yeah, there, there's an old saying in the business when, when you get a stock tip from the shoeshine boy, watch out. <laughs> of course, there are no shoeshine boys. What's the, the, the equivalent these days? Uh, a guy who, uh, laces your, uh, overpriced sneakers? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. God, I haven't had a shoe shine in ages. But I don't wear shoes of, of recent that need shining. And, uh, no, there's some very nice, uh, very comfortable shoes one can wear these days that look decent. And they don't need shining, so that's what I do. I've even got the boots I had made when I graduated from UBC in 1962. There was a boot seller maker out at UBC here called Kovacs. And, man, when you graduated in geology, the first thing you did is you took your paycheck oh, yeah. and ordered a pair of the Kovac boots, handmade, fit beautifully, and I still got a pair. Uh, they're sort of very old friends by now. I was thinking maybe I should take them for a walk. Or would it be the other way around, Jim? The boots, would, <laughs> the boots would be taking me for a walk. I'll have to think about that. We'll take a look at some of the headlines that caught Bob's attention right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. You know, my mom bought me some cowboy boots, and all I used them for was shoveling manure. <laughs> I have brought, I have extra wide feet, and they're just too narrow. Oh, cowboy yeah. boots are just torture. Yeah. I always like running shoes when I rode a horse in case you got tossed off, uh, comfortable to run home in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Hoy. Some of the headlines that caught his attention today. Flawed valuations threaten 1.7 trillion private credit market from Bloomberg. Wow. Yeah. Uh, what's the story there? Flawed valuations? 
Quad valuations. I don't know. Flawed valuations. Yeah. Yeah, I thought you said Claude valuation. No, it's flawed valuations. Uh, well, people are putting prices on assets that they're doing loans against, and I guess they're discovering that some of them were too optimistic. Um, famous court case in New York about uh, valuations. Uh, Country Garden winding up petition reveals private loan risks. Country Garden, uh, I believe, is the biggest real estate company in China. And it's in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, we've we've seen Country Garden before. Yeah. Or maybe not the biggest, but one of the biggest. Yeah, one of the big ones. Uh, again, uh, my interview with Wolf Richter for This Week in Money, which is released on Saturday. Uh, yes, the Chinese real estate crisis is creeping into North America, and he has lots of details and how that's happening because the Chinese investors have to sell here to cover their losses. Oh, back, oh back yeah. Home. Yeah. You got to sell where you can mm -hmm. in order to cover, make your margin calls. Yeah. Oh yeah. Once it's like the boom ripples out, everybody's creating wealth and it spreads around the world and then it goes too far and reverses. And then it's opposite where uh, wealth is being contracted and it spreads from one investor to another and from one jurisdiction in the world to another. And it usually starts in outlying countries. Mm -hmm. And did it start in China? Yeah. And then eventually comes in and hits the financial center. And I've got a quote by Cicero 2,000 years ago explaining that if the eastern provinces in the Roman Empire, meaning Phoenicia and whatnot at the east end of the Mediterranean, when they had an eventual financial problem, it would eventually hit Rome. So that market force is to at least 2,000 years old. Uh, I, so you don't get your Cicero's mixed up. That was Marcus Tilius Cicero. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And okay. Now that we're being picky. Yeah. Kikero. Uh, Kikero. That's right. I took three years of Latin and I know how to pronounce it. Yes. It's not Caesar. It's Kaiser. Yeah. Yeah. U.S. durable good orders collapsed in January. Notice the word collapsed. Yeah. Uh, a few weeks ago, it was some retail sales or something. Yep. Plunged. So, uh, actually, I think I put a little bit in there. Oh, yeah, here. Yeah, collapsed, plunged, screech. Oh, that was a good one. Consumer borrowings, screech to a halt. Retail sales plunged. So, uh, we're getting some very concerning headlines. Yeah, al although... <laughs> I've noticed this trend on the television news. Everything is shocking, disturbing, stunning, and unbelievable. Everything is, Bob. Yeah. Nothing is just, I, oh, they're down a bit. I no, it's a stunning plunge. Yeah, I think <laughs> yeah, you're right. They, they over-exaggerate everything now. Yeah. Uh, how would they describe the outbreak of World War II? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, right. Anyway, uh, U.S. home buying demand nears its worst level since 1995. Yeah, yeah, that's whatever that number is. It's 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 in it's in the ash can. Yeah. Uh, but, I did see a, a headline though that today's millennials will become the richest generation ever. Why would that be, Bob? Oh, that's somebody projecting what's going on now. No, they've ha they've ha they've done it already. They have been the richest, and now the markets are mm. preparing for a post bubble contraction. So maybe it's all the money they saved living in mom and dad's basement. <laughs> and plus, when mom and dad die, get guess who gets that uh, it's the two home. million dollar house and uh, all their investments. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because the generation behind the millennials is struggling yeah. quite severely. Yeah, it's very difficult out there. What would I? I don't know. I was going to call the millennials the whining generation. 
But, <laughs> yeah. yeah well, because, uh, you know, they do. They complain about everything and are going, uh, you're going to do really well. Just wait until mom and dad leave you the house and the cottage. Right. <laughs> Now, uh, some headlines that I, I know that you'd be really interested in. Mercedes ditches plans to sell only EVs by 2030. And that's, and, and don't forget, we have governments in Canada and I think California saying we don't want internal combustion engine vehicles sold after 2030. Here's yeah. Mercedes saying there's no future in that. Yeah. Mercedes, the, the electron, the battery powered vehicle is absolutely impractical very expensive does a lot of harm to the environment in making them and does a lot of harm to the environment trying to get rid of them and in the meantime they blow up and catch fire well uh, according to wolf richter they don't catch fire any more often than gasoline vehicles do but it's just you can't extinguish the flames for three days yeah, yeah. Well, that's true. But I'm going to look up the numbers myself and how the frequency of of uh, mm. fires with uh, gas engines and the frequency with battery. Well, because... I would be very concerned if there was uh, an electrical vehicle parked in my underground parkade and it caught fire because the sprinklers are only designed to put out gasoline fires, not lithium blazes that go oh, for no. three if, days. If we had... Uh, 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 an EV car uh, fire in our basement, it would be a disaster. I've worked on head of the Strata Council quite seriously about making sure that they're uh, not here. And I don't know whether I made any headway or not. Hmm. Uh, headline, Chinese EV makers are going bankrupt, leaving huge EV graveyard behind. Yeah, that's true. You see pictures of them, acres and acres of cars sitting there just waiting to catch fire. <laughs> well, I could just see them being gutted and they put a real engine in. Now, yeah. on the electrical car front, and one company that is doing well is BYD, which stands for Build Your Dream. The Chinese car maker is now outselling Tesla, and they've come up with a luxury vehicle that's designed to compete with uh, your Lamborghinis and Ferraris of the world. It's called the Yang Wang U9. Okay. Now, when I had a Porsche, people used to ask me, how's your Porsche doing? I don't know if I'd like people asking me, how's your Yang Wang doing? <laughs> but, but this little puppy here can do, uh, top end is 192 miles an hour, 309 oh, yeah. Ks does, uh, Zero to 60 in 2.3 seconds, and yep. it will only set you back $230,000 American. Right, yeah. Well, the performance you can get out of these things. Now, how many of those acceleration runs you can do, I don't know. I imagine if you did one of the flat-out acceleration runs, came to a stop and tried another one, that the next go wouldn't have the same numbers, so... Yeah, they run out of juice pretty quickly. Well, yeah, I was going to say, how long can you maintain it at that rate? Not long. Well, I was talking to my friend, the engineer, the automotive engineer guy, and he was telling me that that when you charge an EV, it heats up the circuit right there. So they have a special little cooling circuit, and guess what? The coolant... Uh, liquid is inflammable. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah. So you just can't get away from uh, the hazards of electronic vehicles. So. Yeah. And uh, China, with its uh, economic crisis, President Xi cracks down on hedonistic bankers, and it's now fueling an industry brain drain. Who wants to uh, be a banker if you face a chance of going to a Chinese prison, or worse yet, uh, being forced to kneel down and taking a bullet to the back of the head. Well, I don't know whether they get that severe yet, but anyways, these, uh, I like the line, Z cracks down on hedonistic bankers, so 
guys are just in it for the greed and the good and all that sort of stuff. So, yeah. But the one I thought was interesting, Swedish property giants write down billions as prices crash. So, Mm. you know, even countries that are not at the forefront are generating the headlines. Oh, they're selling a lot of saunas. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Ah, yes, but their meatballs will always be great. Oh, indeed. With the lingonberry sauce. Oh, yeah, and then Aquavit. Oh, you're talking the good stuff. It is. Bob, always fun chatting with you. Yep, and we look forward to next week. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy, the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. If you have a question for Bob, send it to info at howstreet.com. We'll ask that question for you. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on X at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.